And we're ready to take some phone calls. Here we go. Here's our first caller of the night. Go ahead. You're on. You got the most assault of man without a plan. The master all disasters, Rick. It's too bad Chris Guy ain't on tonight. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. Well, I know where he'll be tomorrow. Uh, he'll be at my buddy's house in Windsor, and that's a fact. I just talked to my buddy, oh, yeah. and uh, I should get a hold of Chris Guy to get a hold of you. Okay, so I know where he'll be at about 4 o'clock. I'm not going to say it on here. I might just go do a video for you guys. My favorite place I'm not allowed in either. So it should be interesting. Interesting. So we'll leave it at that anyways. Yeah. But I'll, I'll yeah. track Mr. Sky down. Yeah, he'll see. As for the budget, let's get to the budget and not the car rental place. What a joke. Somebody is trying to get a uh, Christina Freeland. And by the way, I don't know who does her makeup. Is it uh, Anderson's Funeral Parlor? Morticians do a better makeup job. <laughs> but by the way, anyway, somebody was questioning her on why we have a 28% more civil servants working for the government. 28% more than we had seven years ago. That's a big number, Rick. Huge. It's huge. It's a lot of money. Okay. And when the deficit, our interest is a billion dollars a week, just on the interest. We got problems, folks. But they think they deserve a $10,000 a year raise. You will have nothing and you will like it. Well, right now, I got a lot of things. But when I start losing things, I'm not going to like it. Okay. It's already almost unaffordable to buy a vehicle. Never mind put the gas in the, in the, in, the, in, in, in your vehicle that you're going to buy. Yeah. Okay. They're making things very unattainable for, there is no more middle class. That shit's all gone. You know, I, I don't know how people are living on anything less than $50,000 a year. They're trying to raise a family in this country. It's, I'd like to know Show me the secrets. I want to learn. Yeah. But I can't see it happening. Okay, when you're paying $2,000 a month rent, right there is $24,000 a year. Let's say you got to feed your family. Let's be modest. We're not going to eat $6,000 a month, folks. Let's say your grocery bill is $1,500 a month to feed your family. And that's being really nice. Okay, it adds up and it adds up fast. That's without your gas, your hydro your cable, your internet, whatever. Okay? Yep. People are going to start losing shit. Yeah, that's when people are going to start losing their shit mentally. The working class. That's me, baby. Today is Wednesday. I worked 13 and a half hours on Monday night, 13 and a quarter hours last night, and I'm going to work 13 and a quarter tonight, which gives me 40 hours in three days of work and I still got three more days to go or four depending if I want to work Sunday. Now I have to work 60, 70 hours a week to survive. I don't know, Rick, that suicide pill they got out there started to sound really nice. Oh, well, I don't think we want to go there. I'm going to end it. <laughs> Hang I'm on, not going to go out like that. Hang on. I've got That's a call coming in here. Let me take this call. You talk talk to the folks while I take this phone call for just a second. It's maybe important. Okay. I'm running the show, bitches out there. I'm running the show. Rick's taking the call. Okay. So I'm running the show. What do you guys want to talk about tonight? On the ball of the south. It's my show. Let's hear it. I want to. Check out your comments. We're going to let the panel weigh in. Who wants to drink? Dottie wants to drink. Taxes, taxes, taxes. Let's talk about taxes. Can you afford another $4,500 a year in taxes? Because I can't. 
That's a lot of money, folks. It's almost seventy-five dollars a week in taxes. It's sad. So you got Chris Guy coming on by the sounds of it. No more taxes. We need people in politics that are going to take care of us, plain and simple. All right. Rick, I, you got I'm Chris back. Guy there? No, I do have um, someone who was supposed to be on the show the other night that we sort of delayed. So we've got uh, Weldon, the thong man, coming on here in just a minute instead. So we'll have him on. Are you going to put the mouth on the shelf? No, you can keep on talking too. I would never put you. Do I get to talk to Waldo? Is it, is it Waldo or Weldon? Weldon, Weldon. Um, if you wanted to do okay, that, I'd Weldon. have to send you a different link because you're on the phone system, and it's it works kind of weird. You have to go go in through the through another. Uh, another Can I do that through my phone? Oh uh, yeah, I could send it to you. Yeah. I'm really late. I'd love to speak to Walden. Sure. Hang on a second here. Let me get his link sent to him. I guess I'll hang up and send me the link. Yeah, what you, I have to send it by email here. Hang on. Just don't go away for just a second. Too many things going on here all at once. We're doing this all on the fly. Okay. So so back to taxes, folks. I can't afford it. I, I don't know how people are, are doing it, but tell me the secrets. Now, I'm not going to be a thief. Okay, I'm not going to be, what we call it, a hooligan or a hoodlum. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to do it the honest way. And uh, at the end of the day, it's not, it's very, very struggling for me. You know, if I walk off the job, I could just, I can't wait till, till we have a nationwide strike because I'm going to be the first guy going. And I don't give a shit. If I got to be a hooligan, I got to be a thief, I got to be a hoodlum just to make it meet while well, they call it on themselves. They're going to create a whole new spectrum of thieving. And you see it going on. Windsor, Ontario the other day, for instance, guy walks into a basic food store downtown, okay, tasered the fuck, tasered the guy in the store to get the food as he was stealing it. The guy went to stop him, used a taser to feed his family. Wow. Another guy, bear mace. They're using bear mace to steal out of the store. It's getting sickening. That's terrible, man. It is, but what are people going to do, Rick? It's either he said it, heat or eat. You can't have it both ways. Food's a lifeline, man. You don't eat, you die. Yeah. So I think a, I think a cry for help for a lot of people is, you know what? Prison's not so bad for a lot of people because you get your three squares a day. Uh, you get your, your hot, your caught whatever you want to call it, okay? And you get your three squares a day and everything's paid for it or you're not starving. Is that the system that they want? Because they're creating something that I, we're not, I don't think we're prepared for, buddy. Yeah. Actually, you know what? If you're going to join by video, there, use the second one and you can come in over there. Use the, the last link that I sent you. I sent it to you on your Facebook Messenger thing. Okay, I'll, I'll click off over there. Okay. See you guys in a second. All right. Ciao for now. All right, we're just going to drop out of that then all together. And we're going to get uh, Weldon on here. Okay, so we'll get rid of that. And there he is with his cool shades. Hello, you beautiful people. Hey, Rick, how are you? That includes you too, my friend. Uh, for your last caller there, that was uh, three squares and a cop, by the way. Obviously, uh, you know, well, neither one of us have done any time, right? Obviously. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I hear we've had some technical difficulties tonight. Yeah, so we do. And another call coming in from the Toronto area, but I'm not going to pick that up because I don't recognize the number. So that's, where, that... uh, that's where Chris is, though. Yeah, I know. I just don't think that's him. Okay. So... Um, it's not the number that I have for him, so I won't pick that one up. All right. Yeah. So just to caution you, we are on YouTube, Facebook, so we need to be a little bit careful about how we certain words. things. Yeah. Yep. So just uh, to make you aware, and uh, Leo will probably be joining us shortly. And um, 
you wanted to come on to talk about this thing coming up uh, in Ottawa, I guess yes. is what you wanted to discuss. So let's go down that path and, uh, and tell me what's on your mind with regard to that. Well, as you know, the government never goes back on their word and, you know, they always do what they say. And, uh, well, this is a very rare uh, occasion where, you know, they did it uh, one, one, one more time. Uh, we were legally given a permit and then they removed it. They first they said we could have music and we could have speakers. And, uh, you know, then they changed the rules on that. They're, they're all over the place. They're just trying to, you know, make our lives difficult. OK, they so just back a up a little bit, because I don't think a lot of people here maybe are not not aware but there oh, is yeah, yeah. there is an event that was planned or is planned, and I'm not sure because this is all new information to me. Actually, I'd not heard any of this. But there's so a what, um, what happened was we're we're all aware that uh, can I call them treason Trudeau and the Liberals? Is that okay? I already said <laughs> yeah, that. I guess I guess you just did. <laughs> my bad. Uh, that's what I call him because I like to call a spade a spade. That's what he is. Anyways, the honorable. Well, I got a really hard time saying it. Okay. Trudeau. Okay. Um, it, it, there was foreign influence in the elections all over the news. We all know that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making anything up. This, we're not going down a rabbit hole here. Right. Uh, it's been all over the news. We talked about. He took money from the Chinese. Therefore, the election was rigged. It was unlawful, and and they're asking for uh, a, a vote of non-confidence. So we've got patriots that are working hard and they found a legal loophole and they've been working with the law uh stand for the and i believe awake canada there, there's so many wonderful wonderful people uh doing everything we can to bring our, our our beautiful country our great country back to the greatness it deserves canada has been renowned around the world for our our peaceful uh you know our nature loving nature we welcome everybody canada but you know we're the first ones to run into war. I mean, we were the first one. We'll be there to, to defend anybody. Um, and, 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 and we don't want any anything going on. We don't want... Anyways, I want this weekend to be loving and peaceful, but they've taken away our permit. First, they said you can have music and radio and all that and speakers. Now they said no. Now they've re redacted or retracted, sorry, the, uh, the the permit that we have to legally protest. Uh, the buzz is all over. There's people coming. Everybody's coming. Okay. Don't let, like, every time the government's, they, they, I don't know if it's Antifa or the government or if it's in, I don't know who's doing it, but every time they're like, oh, mm, man, we can't go. Mm, things have changed and, oh, it just could get ugly and we might get a ticket and they might tow our vehicles. Well, guys, if you're in the movement and you're, and you're fighting for freedom uh, and that's going to worry you a little bit, uh, as long as we're, we're, we're doing, what we can according to our bill of rights uh charter two subsection a b c and d we got the freedom of expression freedom of movement freedom of speech and the biggest one is is freedom to protest and there's a little there's a little statement in there that's very important it says especially when it has to do with the public interest okay i'm suing police officers and i'm suing security guards and a hospital coming up shortly for the same reason because they arrested me for legally protesting which is our Bill of Rights, subsection two, section D. I think it's D. Anyways, A, B, C, and D. Look them up. Um, they are trying to scare you. Okay, go there. We do it peacefully. We do it legally. That is our rights. And if you're not going to fight for our rights, you might as well have never joined this, you know, freedom movement. This, you know, stay home. Okay. I think everybody should go there. Chris Guy's coming there. He's going to be there Saturday. I'm talking every day on stage. I'm going to be like an MC. Uh, I'm, I'm introducing Chris on Saturday at noon. I'm going there Friday. I, I, I don't care. Okay. If the government is going to do what they're going to do, then why, you know, why are you going to stop? We're, we're doing this to, to prevent them from their draconian laws. So guys, everybody's got to come down. Uh, there's a buzz out there. It's going to be a hundred to 200,000 people. And, 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 and if we get Chris Guy down, there could be even more. But, guys, don't let them scare you away. We're not doing anything illegal. This is our government. This is Parliament Hill, okay? Let's, let's have a little bit of uh, respect. And, and, and as much as I love them, let's not fly the F Trudeau flags. Well, you know, don't bring hockey sticks. My, I got an F Trudeau flag and a hockey stick, and I love it, okay? But, guys, just bring little flags. Canadian, wear your shirts, okay? 
come on down. We need you, okay? We need to be there for, for, for three days minimum. We got a permit. They gave it to us. If they retracted it, it's too late. We've already organized it, and we're allowed to be there anyways, okay? Um, I don't want any violence. I want it done peacefully. If anything happens, I wish I was there last time, but my truck was stolen when uh, when the stuff hit the fan last time, um, you know, when the horses came in. If that happens, guys, okay, turn your backs to the police. Sit down, lock your arms, lock your legs, sit down, and start singing O Canada. Turn your backs to them, okay? We can't beat them with weapons. We can't beat them with violence. But if the rest of the world sees that we're loving, we're peaceful, and we sit down, we turn our backs to them, and they still trample, trample on our rights and our freedoms. Um, it's a fan loving the truck, guys, They're all the time here. Um, one second here. I'm doing a live video, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Oh, he's cute. He's got a dog with him. Um, I love it, man. Uh, people everywhere are, are rooting for, for us, and we need them. Uh, we need everybody down there this weekend. Guys, let's do it lovingly. Let's do it peacefully. But please show up. Don't be afraid. There's tons of places you park outside, um, you know, down the street. You walk into Wellington. We walk up. They can't stop us coming in. Uh, so we'll, we'll bring megaphones. We can't bring radios. We'll talk with megaphones. Okay, they're just trying to make our lives difficult. But please, please keep it peaceful. But we got to do this. If, if you don't go, well, then just give up. Put your flags away. Stop your protesting. And, and, and give up and let the Canadian government do whatever the hell they want. When did you receive news that they had revoked the permit to assemble on Jason Parliament Hill? Jason Lavasi, they're, 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 uh, yeah, so it's, it's on. Um, because I know so many people in, in the movement, I get text messages all the time. It's like, it's like you know, deet, 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 deet. I get all this stuff coming up on my phone. Uh, I'm forever getting notices. And um, they're, they're saying that the permit was re uh, rejected uh, or removed, re you know, appeal. I don't know, whatever they call it. Uh, it's just, it's just debauchery. It's it's just again they're they're um, they're, they're lunatics. They're they're draconian. Uh, they've got an agenda, and uh, and they don't want us, you know, standing up for our rights. Uh, they want us to shut up, sit down, and do as we're told. And they're slowly withering away all of our rights and freedoms. And 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 this is the time to stand up. Uh, this is uh, this is there's never been a better time. There is no better evidence that that that. Mm -mm -mm, Trudeau mm -mm, um, didn't break the law at the highest one of the highest uh, is, is that you cannot have outside interference and we had foreign influence in the election it was rigged it's a damn rigged election he got money he was caught sending money back to China as you know Rick like how, how stupid is that like at least well, I don't know what you're talking about you know but he sent the money back he was caught red handed Pierre Polivier, which I don't trust. You know, he called him out on it. There he is. There's the man. Hello, Leo. Leo, Weldon, Weldon, Leo. Mel Weldon, Mello. Leo. Bond Who's man. Leo, my friend? I can't really see the suns in my eyes. Great glasses. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Rick, uh, I wanted to fill in some time because of the technical difficulty. Do you want me to let you go with your, uh, with, with, with your, uh, with no, Leo he here? wanted to, he wanted to participate because you're here. Yeah. Oh, I thought he said, Leo? I thought he said you were bringing, uh, uh, Waldo on. Yeah, no, this is Waldo. Weldon. It's Weldon. But <laughs> if, I had like, that orange Weldon? Duke, if I had that orange Duke, you'd never know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How are you, my yeah. friend? Good. How's the weather in Barry? I'm actually in Lindsay right now. I'm uh, I'm working at a, a commercial uh, construction job, and um, yeah, I got I got to go back to Barry tomorrow morning and finish the job there. And then 6 a.m. 6 a.m. We've got a big convoy. We got lots of people. Uh, we're leaving. <clears throat> we're meeting up three different groups, um, and we're coming into Ottawa. We're coming in loving. We're coming in peaceful. And we're coming in under our Bill of Rights and Charter of Freedoms, baby. So you're, you're just like me. You're working class. Uh, we're going to have nothing and we're going to like it at the end of the day, right? See, where have I heard that before? Exactly. You know, I'm working for nothing at the end of the day. Okay. And I'm working 70 hours a week, brother. Okay. I don't even have time to, to, to hold a picket sign and, and strike if I wanted to go on a strike, nationwide strike. 
But I will there's make a, time for that. That's a fact. There's a lot of people like that. But, you know, we're not working for nothing. The government's so broke. You know, we, we all got to pay more taxes because uh, they, they need to keep spending it and giving it away. So the poor government, you know, we, we need to work. We need to amp it and ramp it up. You know, you need to work 90 hours a week and uh, and you'll love it. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to love it. You know, <laughs> I, I, me, I'm a machinist in a tool shop, right? Uh, this is my new jail cell, by the way. Nice. Right. And uh, this is my new jail cell. And I put a lot of time in here every night, uh, 13 and a half hours on Monday. I was telling Rick, 13 hours and a quarter last night and probably 13 or 14 hours tonight. I go in at three in the morning. Sometimes I stay till seven in the morning. Uh, if I don't do that, then I have to go back to uh, what we say. Uh, oh, there he is, Mr. Chris Guy, finally. Hey, hey, we got hey I, I just talked to uh, hey, Brian. Guys. He said, Brian said you're going to be at his house, Chris, tomorrow. And I told Brian to get a hold of you to get on here. I was in a meeting. Our phones were off. I didn't see the time. And then when I got off, I was like, holy shit. I didn't know we were in the meeting for that long. I am so sorry, guys. I already Chris, had I uh, another show was today. I was in a meeting all day. <laughs> I, well, I can't wait to hear what you have to say, It's always a pleasure <laughs> to watch you. Yeah, so... I, I appreciate I'm you. To, uh, I'm going to try to hook up. If you guys give me one sec, I'm going to try to hook up the sound to the car so I can hear you properly. Sure. So you will be in Windsor tomorrow, I heard, eh? But it's uh, private, I heard. How did you know about that? It's supposed to be a secret. <laughs> I'm the mouth of the South, the man without a plan, the master of all disasters, brother. I know everything. Apparently. Jesus. I was going to come and meet you again. For the tenth time. <laughs> well, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be coming there tomorrow. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to get this sound proper. If you give me one second, I am really sorry. While he's working on that, Chris, I can give you an update. Apparently, they've uh, they've withdrawn the permit for Ottawa. We're not allowed to have sound now, and uh, they've retracted the permit. And everybody's like, "Oh, well, I don't know if I should go now." So. I came on, uh, you know, to kind of fill in the gap until you got uh, your technical difficulties dealt with. But Actually, yeah. he just popped off there. He's not even linked in right now. Oh, He's okay. going to have to well. reestablish. So he can't hear you at the moment. Weldon? No. No That's funny. Hey, 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 Rick, I, uh, anything south of London that happens, the mouth of the south knows everything that happens down south of uh, south of London, right? So. Yep, you are connected. Very connected. I was telling uh, Rick, uh, the other night, a good friend of mine, Wes Weber, he said, who's that? He's a really good friend of mine, lives in Toronto. He was a counterfeiter, and he was convicted for about $40 million in counterfeit $100 bills. It's called the Weber bill, and his money was so clean that it's still in circulation today. He's on Masterminds <laughs> of Crime. I'm going to get him on here for Rick, along with Mark Emery and a few other of my friends, and uh, get the show going. Yeah, I look forward to that. Those are those would both be fantastic interviews to have. I remember Mark Emery from my younger years when he had City Lights Bookstore in London, Ontario. I used to go down to that bookstore all the time. And uh, I interviewed him as a, a young reporter a few times. But he yeah, probably- he's, he's quite the character, Rick. Yeah. He's, uh, he's talented. He's smart. He's articulate, just like Wes Weber. When you get to meet Wes Weber, I've sat in meetings, business meetings with Wes Weber, and people said, is that your lawyer? I said, no. He's just here to guide me because he's a businessman, and he knows what time of day it is, right? Uh, when you're dealing with uh, City Hall, uh, you're dealing with politicians, okay? The guy's been around town, right? So, and the remarkable thing about his story, once he tells you the story, you can watch it. He's on Masterminds of Crime. It's called the, uh, the Weber... I think it's called the Weber Bill, uh, YouTube. Uh, but he was on the show Masterminds of Crime, right? And in, in that yeah. uh, segment, uh, I think he only got about six months in jail at the end of it, right, for $40 million of Canadian counterfeit currency that's still in circulation today, which is pretty remarkable. So <laughs> talk about a license to print. There he is. He's back. I swatched, I switched, switched devices, guys, because I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't get it to come through the cars. Bluetooth, we're on the move right now. I'm on my way to Niagara Falls. I have another meeting and another show at 8 o'clock. 
So my day is literally by the friggin' second. And my campaign team's not even here yet. And our campaign's not even officially underway. But I've never been so busy in my life. I've never slept so little in my life. But I've never been more excited in my life. Because we got... Yeah. Yeah, we got an opportunity right now for something very, very powerful, very important. I'm going to get a bigger platform than I ever have before. And when I win as mayor, I'm going to be put in a position where I can help a lot more people than I ever even imagined. And I can put more hurt on the people that are doing this agenda to us than I could ever have imagined. So I've never been more fired up. And they're going to try to come at me with everything they got. They've been trying. They had elections. Toronto uh, threatened me. They had Pierre Polyever and his lawyers, uh, Goodman's Law, threaten me. They had the RCMP arrest me and my wife five days ago. They had to ba they banned me from Edmonton Airport to try to stop me from flying here. They had Airbnb uh, block my account so I couldn't uh, rent the house I needed for my campaign team. They had the old mill cancel my friggin' April 16th event, so making me and, get another and venue. And you know the reason why they're trying to cancel Ottawa this weekend? They, they took the permit back. I don't know if you heard that yet. I did hear oh, that. It's, and they it's did all your fault, you criminal. <laughs> it is my fault. And I think the reason they did that is so people like me and you, if we go down there, they can uh, they can try to say that we're inciting an insurrection because now we don't have a permit. And then they can either make me look really bad for my political campaign or B, even arrest me. Because since I just got off my big charges yesterday, if everybody knows about that, assault with deadly weapon on police officers, threatening to kill all the premiers in Canada, and dangerous operation of a motor vehicle to boot. They wanted to throw me in jail for years. They were dragging my... Of course. And they dragged my name through the mud for the last two years. I wasn't able to drive. They took my gun license, all my guns. They took my driver's license. And even after I was found completely not guilty yesterday, I still had all the same conditions. They still have my guns. They still have my gun license. And I had to fight just to be able to drive again. And now, even though I was found not guilty in court, I have to go and do a special hearing just to get my own property back and to be able to get a pal again. This is after being found completely not guilty. This is after being arrested 26 times. This is after beating 60 plus charges in four or five different provinces. It's ridiculous, and they're but targeting free, me. But, but we're free, Chris, to remember that. We're free, right? It's all good. People, if people think we're free when they can do this to me, they can do this to anybody. And exactly. they're going to do it to anybody, anybody who stands up. And if you don't think that's true, well, you saw what happened with the trucker convoy. How many business licenses got pulled? How many people's bank accounts got frozen? How many people got trampled or beat up by uh, by uh, paid thugs? The, the government will do whatever it has to do to continue itself. That's its number one priority. Continuity of government at your expense if you're in the way, by by uh, by the way. So, so just, be uh, just before you came on, Chris, I was telling everybody because it's all a buzz on, the, uh, on, on uh, social media. And I said, guys, if, if you're not going to stand up for your rights, you might, you might as well have never gotten involved in this movement in the beginning. Uh, you know, go home, you go in your little shelters and, and stay hidden. Everybody's got to get to Ottawa this weekend. Uh, we got to exercise our Bill of Rights, Section 2, A, B, C, and D. And uh, I, uh, everybody's got to get down there. I'm okay. going to be honest with you guys. I don't think Ottawa's a good idea anymore. I think Ottawa's a setup. And I think Ottawa was a setup from the beginning. Because in order to get a permit, and I told you this on the phone, I told you this, Weldon, I didn't like the idea because he said he's going to get a permit for three days. And then he said he's going to sit in as long as it takes after the fact to make sure that Justin Trudeau resigns. That makes no uh, sense. Why would you get well, a it's permit? An open permit? It's an open permit. But you know no, they're not going to keep renewing it indefinitely. You know they're not going to renew that indefinitely. So he knew, as well as I did, as well as anybody with sense did, that you're going to put all those people in a position that the permit's going to expire and then the government's going to have the, the, the legal authority to come down on them. And it's going to be harder... To, for that, it's going to be harder authority to come down on them because they had a permit. They signed their name to a permit for a specific period of time. If you're going to do a protest like that where you're going to sit in and you're going to try to sit in and outlast the government, you don't ask for a permit. You just do it. The very act of asking for a permit already negated that. And now that they took the permit away, if people like me show up there, they're going to use it against us politically. They're going to use it against us legally. And they're going to use it against the whole movement. 
And I don't even think it's a good idea to go there now that the, uh, uh, under those auspices now that the permit got changed. If people were going to go there for an actual freedom protest, if people were going to go there to talk about stopping 15-minute cities, talk about stopping the personal carbon allowance, talk about stopping digital ID and things like that, it would make sense. To go there now without a permit and say, we're here to try to force Justin Trudeau to resign and try to remove the liberal government, well, you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of problems. Especially now that the permit's been revoked. We don't, we don't need a permit. We're legally allowed to protest. That's our Bill of Rights. What do you They're going to tell you. Then just put your flags, go home, and let the government do whatever the hell it wants to do. What do you a, think? Protest, a protest is one thing. Having a sit-in in Parliament demanding that the re Prime Minister resign and demanding that the Liberal Party relinquish power is a little bit different. They're going to call well, that well, an insurrection. He took, he took foreign influence, Chris. He took foreign influence. We're going this is true. I'm not just, that is wrong. I'm not I, disagreeing I with to, the, I, ha I have to say I agree with Chris. Thank you. 100%. Chris, Thank you, Rick. What, what do you think of a nationwide strike like they're doing in France and in Israel? Okay, we're, we, we're taxed to death. I can hardly even breathe at 70 hours a week working, Okay. A if, if we across the board, you cut the head off the serpent, you take the money away from them. If we could range that in Canada, I'd be all for it. The problem is Canadians and strikes and organizing millions and millions of them to do it is a lot easier said than done because Canadians are still apathetic. Well, our biggest strength is six months to make it hurt them. You got to do it for a long time to hurt them. They got billions. And that's the problem. In places like France, where they have culture and they have history, the people are are, uh, are are tightly knit. They can do that. And that's why you're seeing protests in the millions and millions of people. And that's why you're seeing those protests carry on. But in Canada, those kind of protests over, uh, over a strike, most Canadians still believe in their federal government. The biggest, re the, biggest, the biggest strength we have right now is the fact that our movement used to be just the anti-maskers, just the anti-vaxxers, just the so-called conspiracy theorists. Now, we have a very large portion of the population that took that vaccine and either got vaccine injured or realized they took it for absolutely no reason except they got coerced by the government. So now we're at a point in time. Experimental vaccines. Experimental yes, we know that. And, and now we're at a point in time where there's lower amount of trust in the government, the media, and the medical establishment than ever before. That is why I took the opportunity to try to run for mayor, because I believe that the people are ready for real change. The people are ready for someone with integrity. The people are ready for someone with transparency. The people are ready for someone that they can contact. Just like you could contact me, Weldon, anyone can contact me. They know my number. It's 416-400-9994. And I challenge any mayoral candidate or any political candidate anywhere in the world to go and give out their personal phone number to all of their constituents to prove that they are actually representatives of the people, accountable to the people, and reachable by the people. Let's see who does it. I bet I'll be the only one. Can I can I, I tell I, you about I, the first time I called you a little bit? Go ahead, brother. So I just called. I got a, I just I got a phone I think call. I'm going to have to take three months off of work. <laughs> I got a phone call from a, an independent news guy, um, and, and and he called. He wanted to interview me uh, on my opinion of Chris Guy uh, running for mayor. I said, "Well, anybody who's doing what he's doing, uh, you got to give him an applause." And, and he wondered, "Well, you know, what do you think of personally?" And I said, "Well, there's so much gossip out there." I said, "I, I you know, you, you got to go straight to the horse's mouth." You know, I, I've heard so many stories where they say the same thing about me. Uh, you know, we got to stop the, the hating and start the love. Let's get the facts straight. And he goes, well, get the facts straight. Give Chris a call. And uh, I said, well, I don't have his number. So he gave me his number. And I called him up. Were you in? Uh, were you at Wesson when I called yeah, you? Yeah, I was still in Edmonton. Yeah. So uh, what was it? Must have been like seven in the morning because I called. I don't know it was like nine or something in the morning. It was. It, it must. I think I didn't know if I woke him up. But as soon as I heard his voice, I went. Holy shit, this is Chris Sky. And he goes, well, who the fuck did you think it would be? You called me. <laughs> and right away, I love the guy. Uh, we talked. You know, this is this is our future mayor. He didn't know me from a hole in the ground. I called him up. He talked to me for an hour. We talked about everything. We talked about everything we've been through. 
And uh, we, you know, and, and, he, and he told me, call him anytime. And, you know, he calls me up. I call him up. This is not just a politician. He's not a politician. He's one of us. And everybody needs to vote for him. He's our, tr- our truest hope right now. Toronto is a hot spot for politics. And, and guys, well, Tom, we need donations, okay? Go ahead, Chris. Back to you. Tom, send some money in. You want to get our government back on track. And well, you if you don't mind, if back. you don't mind, Weldon, I'd, I, you know, I'd like to maybe ask a couple of questions. Please do. I like to answer questions. That's my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Um, you're not listed, you know, by the mainstream media as a candidate yet. Is that because you, you're dealing with a residency issue? I think you said that you're not officially able to, to you're not, it's April 1st or something. April 3rd is when everybody is eligible to be a candidate, and I have a property in Toronto. Everybody's lying and trying to pretend like I don't, and it's a rumor going around, just like the rumor that I was vaccinated, just like the rumor that my teeth are big, just like the rumor that anything they say about me. It's all bullshit. I have a property I have a property in Toronto I'm going to be using to register. Uh, I am going to have the nominations that I need, the 25. There's nothing they can do to stop me from registering as a candidate. The only reason the mainstream media is not listing me as a candidate is because they're absolutely terrified of me. Because I'm the only one that represents actual change. I'm the only one that will stop the 15-minute city agenda. I'm the only one that will stop the carbon allowance, the digital ID, the digital currency. All the rest of these cronies are exactly that. They're politicians. How many of them? What did they do in the last three years? I was fighting for everybody. I was getting arrested for everybody. I was fighting these very politicians that what did they do in the last three years? Every single time they voted to extend the lockdowns. Every single time they voted to give themselves pay raises. Every single time they voted for every restriction that destroyed people's lives. Well, I was fighting these people tooth and nail. They were doing everything in their power to make your lives a living hell. And now they want to take control of Toronto and bring you to the next level of tyranny. And I'm the only one that's there to stop them. So some of those issues like the, you know, the personal carbon credit, the digital ID, those are things that are coming down more from the federal and provincial levels, are they not? So how would you as the mayor tackle those kinds of issues? The 15 minute cities is all is all within the municipal budget. I would make sure there's no municipal budget for any 15 minute city design. As soon as I see developments that are going to take away car lanes and add bike and pedestrian lanes, they're going to take away underground parking and and, and, uh, remove the minimum parking and replace it with maximum parking. Those are not going to get funded. It's that simple. And we're not going to let it happen. And there's lots of ways. And there's lots of ways we can stop uh, digital ID in municipal levels. We can add, we can, we can pass bylaws under the strong mayor's act that forbid Toronto businesses from using digital ID, even if they put it in at the federal level. So, and when they, and then when they see Toronto standing up and doing things like that, how many other municipalities will put pressure on their elected representatives to do the same and, and keep their freedom intact. That's what we're going to do. The strong mayor's act applies in Toronto and Ottawa um, gives, would give you special veto powers. Yes. But a lot of people are concerned that, it's it's maybe too much power that it becomes sort of dictatorial at a certain well, they, point. They're, so, if they're, they still put a clause in there that if 66 percent of council uh, tries to tries to go votes against your veto, that you can be overturned. So there are still there are still safeguards in place. And I wouldn't be using it in a way like they used it. They use it in a way to impose restrictions on people's lives. They use it in a way to close down businesses. They use it in a way to try to force you to stay home or get fined. Yeah. I would use it in a way to prevent them from implementing the next phases of their agenda that are going to take away more freedoms and more financial stability from every single person in the country. But you have a pretty woke council there, so you'd be at odds every with one a of lot of them, do. I would think. Pardon? You, you have a pretty woke council. I think you'd have you'd find yourself at odds with a lot of those councillors. I mean, I'm not intimately involved or familiar with Toronto municipal issues, but that, that I think you're going to be up against a real challenge there. Well, guess what I would do? Any counselor that's going to vote against the will of the people, I'd make them public. I'd hold a press conference. I'd put them before the people. And then we'll see if they still vote the way that they're supposed to vote or the way that their bosses told them to vote. And by their bosses, I mean the people that are paying them behind the scenes. 
the people that all all made them vote for extended restrictions, the people that all voted for their own pay raises. We'll yeah. see how it is when they're actually accountable to the people, and we're gonna see how many counselors actually stick around when we start going and we start uh, when we start going into the corruption in the Toronto government. Because when I called the when I called and when I go online and I try to ask them, hey, can you give me a breakdown of where the sixteen point one one billion dollar budget goes by department? They said, absolutely not. How can you have, you only have so many departments within the government. You have $16 billion budget. So technically it shouldn't be too hard to figure out how many billion went, or hundreds of millions went to each department that should add up to 16.1 billion. But for some reason, that's a secret. You know what that means? That means they're stealing billions of dollars every year, billions of dollars that could be put back into communities. And at the same time, they're creating the crises. The number one crisis in Toronto, besides the cost of living crisis, is the housing crisis, which is part, which is part and party of the cost of living crisis. And I've been a developer for 20 plus years. And one of the hardest things to do in Toronto is get permits. And the red tape and bureaucracy involved cost you months and months of delays. Those months of delays cost millions of dollars in interest payments and salaries for these giant corporations. And it slows down how many prod how much product can actually be developed and built. So as a mayor, not only can I save billions of dollars from the budget and put that back into the small into the uh, the lower the minority communities and the poorer communities and the more uh, vulnerable citizens like homeless and veterans who actually need that money. Well, then I could do things like lower the time it takes for permits for developers and builders to be able to actually build faster and more efficiently and increase the overall production in the city, which would help stabilize housing prices and actually stabilize the so-called housing crisis altogether. But they don't want to do that because they like having crises. Because when they have crises and they have emergencies, it gives them the opportunity to steal more money and it gives them the opportunity to take more power. And so every single time, the people lose. So you're looking already at a budget crisis there. And in fact, I think the, de the the acting mayor today addressed this in some sort of a news conference. You have almost, uh, I think, $900 million shortfall that they're hoping will be filled in with some transfer payments that are, seem murky and may not actually arrive. So how would you deal with, with that immediate crisis? I got to well, go, guys. I got to go. Sorry. I just want to quickly say about the 15-minute cities, guys. If you don't believe that, go and look at any subdivision that's been built in the last 30 years. There's one entrance in and one entrance out. Chris, I love you. I, I hope the hell I see you Saturday. If not, uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Leo, nice to see you. Rick, always a pleasure. I got to go, you. my friends. Peace and love. Thanks. See you, Weldon. Take care, my friend. See you, Weldon. Rick, to answer your question, the very first thing I would do as mayor is go through the federal budget with a forensic accounting team and try to save every dollar I can. And I guarantee we wouldn't save 900 million. We'd save a couple billion. So I'd be able to get rid of that budget shortfall like that and still have a shit ton of money left over for social programs and to reinvest in the city and reinvest in the people. That would be the very first thing I tackle. Because when they tell you they're going to get a $900 million federal, federal money, what does that mean? There's only one taxpayer, Rick, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal, it's coming out of your left pocket, your right pocket, or your jacket pocket every single time. So they're literally just shuffling the money around, but every single time it's coming from your pocket, every single time. How does a city like Toronto that has a higher GDP of most countries in the entire world and only have to service a few million people run a $1 billion shortfall? That means there's more corruption, theft, and waste in Toronto than virtually any other city in the world. And you know what that means? That means there's more room for improvement in this city than any other city in the world. And we've seen it over the last 30 years, a slow, steady decline in the standard of living in the city. And every single year, as the government gets bigger and the government does less with more, it's been asking the population to do more with less. And we can finally change that, flip it, and get us back on a path of progressive improvement. So 30 years from now, we're in a better situation, not in a, a dire situation, because that's where we're headed. We went from a greatest city in the world to a really bad situation. And in another 20 years of where we're headed, it's going to be a dire situation, probably unfixable. But we can fix it, and we can fix it right now.
Well, you are right. These problems with the finances started 25 or 30 years ago with the, around the time of amalgamation. So there's no question about that with no real plan for the, the budgetary process. What are your views on mega projects like the, uh, the Gardner Expressway rehabilitation? Well, if they're going to do it as inefficiently as the Eglinton Avenue place, uh, my wife is an American citizen. We've been married almost 10 years. She's been here almost 13 years. She remembers 13 years ago them still working on that same intersection. So to me, I think that's probably the longest running money laundering scheme in Canada. Because if that was done by a private company, they would have been fired about 150 times by now. But somehow the city just keeps getting away with extending it year after year after year. We don't even know how many billions they've wasted so far. So I would work I would work on all these construction improvements, but I would do it in a way where it's a public and private partnership. And I wouldn't be just giving out contracts to my friends. I'd be giving out contracts to the people that are going to do the job for the cheapest price, the most efficiently, create the most jobs, create the most GDP, and give us the best possible result. So you're in favor of these uh, citizen advocacy groups that are calling for a review of, uh, of the Expressway project? I would call for a review just because I don't believe they're going to do it efficiently. And I would call for a review budgetary wise, not because I don't believe in the project, but I believe the way they're going to do the project, they're going to waste a lot of money. They're going to steal a lot of money. So I'd want to do the project, but I'd want to have the reins and I'd want to keep everybody on a very, very short leash. And we would, and we would do, we would do massive analysis to see what we believe it would cost in the private sector and get multiple companies to price it out just like we would in the private sector. And that's how we would do it more efficiently. And at that point, I would be 100% in favor of it when I know it's being done right and I know they're not wasting money and I know it's going to have a net benefit to the city, not just be another friggin' hole of money laundering and corruption. Yesterday, the premier, Doug Ford, uh, said that People should not vote for any mayoral candidates that would cut funding to Toronto police. What's your and position I, on that? I agree. I, I, I hate to say it, but I agree with Doug Ford. I think, our, I think we need more police, but I think the police need to be reappropriated. What, what was their primary goal the last three years? Revenue generation. Giving single mothers tickets when their husbands just got fired from their jobs and their kids are going through mental health crisis, and you're going to give them thousands of dollars of fine because they decided to sit on a park bench in front of their house. That kind of garbage has to stop. And if we reappropriated the police and we gave them new directives to actually serve and protect the public rather than use, think of each citizen as a cash cow they can extract funding from, I guarantee you. There would be a total change in attitude and people would start respecting the police again and the police would start protecting and being more involved in the communities. And these things like the TTC violence would slowly go away. And so our streets would be safer, happier. And I don't believe in cutting the police budget. But once again, I believe in going through it with a fine tooth comb and finding ways to save money. And so then we could use the same budget they already have to hire new officers and reappropriate those officers for, for, uh, for roles that I believe will be far more beneficial to the community. So you would take a seat on the, uh, the police services board? Oh, of course I would. Yeah, not every 100%. Mayor. I want to be, I want to be directly involved with them because I think they're an integral part of the community. I think one of the main pillars of having a safe and, uh, and happy city is having a really good relationship between the police and the community. And that would be one of my primary objectives is to repair that fractured relationship. Because when I was yeah. young growing up, we looked at the police like heroes. Now when kid, when uh, young kids look at them, they look at them like scared of them. And it shouldn't be like that. Did you want to ask something, Leo? Yeah, actually, you know what? There's nothing that Chris Guy just said that I don't dis I, I, I don't disagree with. Okay? Everything he said is spot on. What has to happen. Okay, when you're in Windsor tomorrow, try to take uh have, have Brian take you to the Gordy Howe Bridge. Okay, we've been on that project since 2007, and it's oh. still not even close to being done, brother. So that's it, that's scary. See, that that's a, that's the one thing that I'm different from every other candidate. From 18 years of age, I was working in the private sector in the development industry, which meant I had to deal with the public sector. So I had to be able to cut through the red tape, deal with the bureaucracy and all the layers of garbage but still be within the budgetary and time constraints of the private sector.
Nobody else can say that. Nobody else can say that they were able to work in the public sector with the efficiency of a private sector employee. That's what I do. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. So not only do I bring that to the table, that efficiency and that frugality and that ability to really, really make every dollar count, but I'm in a very unique position to understand the 15-minute city and understand how it's going to affect people. And it's not in a good way. You know what? I seen you a month ago. I seen you in Toronto. I think we got not think when uh, we had the uh, the march going on. The last march in Toronto. I told you you're gonna have to get rid of that couch in the mayor's office. It's seen more ass and crack pipes and scandals than you can count. Okay. And There's you know a what? question here from uh, from a uh, somebody in the the audience says, what would Chris do different than Faith Goldie? She had a great platform as well, but was shut down by media and was denied debating. Go, Chris, go. That's from well, MM. Number one, Faith Goldie did not have nearly the following that we have. Not even friggin' close. I don't even know why people compare me to her. The only reason we're comparable is because we had similar ideology. But she did not have the, she did not have the nearly the platform we have. She did not going to have the resources we have. She did not have the campaign team we have. I have a literal all-star campaign team. Every single person on my team is the best of the best of what they do. And unlike all the other political candidates, I didn't grab these people by having my, my uh, people come and throw money at them. No, they sought me out because they saw me as their best opportunity to affect the change we need in this country. So when you got people with these special skills and you got people with this passion that are actually coming out and volunteering their services, their time and their skill set, there's nothing stronger than that. And nobody's going to be running a campaign like me. No one rented a house for their entire campaign team to come and live under the same roof. No one's going to be working 20 hours, 22 hours a day. No one's going to be doing multiple shows a day like I do and going to multiple venues a day like I do. Because nobody has that drive. No one has the passion. No one has the energy. And nobody's doing it for the right reasons. All these other candidates are there because they see it as a political opportunity. They see it as a job opportunity, a career opportunity, a pay raise, a power grab. To me, it's a sacrifice for my lifestyle, but for the for, for the movement and for what we've been trying to accomplish, it's a death blow because Toronto is like the jugular vein of the World Economic Forum agenda. And if we can stop the 15-minute city agenda there, the carbon allowance digital ID there, other cities, other provinces will want to follow suit. And that will reverberate not just around Canada, but right down south to the United States. There's going to be a there's going to be a revolution of thought in the United States very soon, and it's happening shake right it now as we speak. Shake it up, shake it up, Chris. You're gonna you're gonna shake it to the core, and I love it. You got enthusiasm, you got backbone, you got wit. You're intelligent, you're young, you're vibrant. Okay, and this is what we have to do in politics. Shake it up, man. Shake it up. Wow. Rick, I, I love your questions, Rick. Keep them coming. Yeah. So how are you going to reach out across the political spectrum to get, you know, enough people to vote for you? Because I think your base of support is pretty much within what people would describe as the freedom movement. But you need to appeal to a, a broader cross section to win. Although, you know, the vote's going to be split up. There are a lot of candidates, so it's hard to say how things will shake down. No, you know who I appeal to more than anybody, Rick? The non-voter. That's who I appeal to, Rick. And you know how many people voted in the last mayoral election for John Tory? Only 29% of the eligible voters. That means 71% of the people, they weren't, they weren't liberal, they weren't conservative, they weren't left, they weren't right. They were non-voters because they understood that none of those candidates represented their interests. When I run, why do you think the media doesn't want to mention me? Because they know if they mention me, all those non-voters, which represent 71% of the electorate, are going to come out and they're going to vote. And they're going to vote for me. Because I've never voted in my life, but I would vote for me. And so will the other people that think exactly like me. And that is the biggest demographic by far. <laughs> PDS uh, says, for question of Chris Guy, well, Doug Ford, will Doug Ford grant you powers for you, Mayor, when you win? I don't understand. I guess he's trying to say if uh, Doug Ford's going to try to block block me from being able to. He said he wouldn't do that on TV, no matter who won. 
So I don't think he would he would try. If I do things that are really against people that are close to him, I'm sure he will try to help them out. But it's not like he can really do much. He could try to slow down the rate at what we get our funding from as the premier, but he couldn't really prevent me from running the city the way that I want to or the way that I need to. Yeah, Laro says, is he married and a family man? That's my wife right there, that beautiful, wonderful goddess. That's Jenny, and she's driving right now. We've been married almost 10 years. And we also, we have eight dogs at home. We run a wolf hybrid sanctuary. So we have uh, about four or five we rescued and the other ones we bought. But we take uh, wolf hybrids in that other people say they can't handle or they're bad dogs, and we rehabilitate them. So you've kind of jumped around a little bit politically because you had some affiliation with the Republican Party of Canada. Then you sort of had a falling out with Maxime Bernier from the PPC. I think that's been patched up. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you've, you've at times told people not to vote. Now you're asking people to vote for you. Can you just explain what your political ideology is or help me make some sense of where you're at? Of course. With the Republican Party of Canada, uh, I thought it was a great idea when I thought the man that was doing it was a genuine person. He basically passed him off like the, himself off like a Canadian version of Donald Trump, a multi-billion dollar banker with the same type of ideology. And then I found out he was nothing but a con artist and a fraud. And he's actually the reason, one of the reasons I had all those charges against me because he knew I was going to have him charged for fraud when I found out he was stealing money from people. So instead, he called the police and said I threatened to kill him and all the premiers in Canada and lied and said he had a tape recording. And that was the basis for all those charges against me. So Rob Carbone, and if you look him up and look at his record, he has a very lengthy record for fraud, theft uttering death threats. And these are not charges. These are convictions. So he's a career criminal for the last 30, 40 years. So that's why I was not, I didn't want to associate with him. With regards to Maxime Bernier, I never had association with the PPC and I never really supported the PPC because I believe he's, I just believe that he's a leader that's not going to be able to let them win. I do believe there's a lot of good people in the PPC party because there's people that are from the private sector. There's people that have been pillars of their community for 20 plus years running. So out of all the parties that are in, that are in politics today, I believe uh, the seats are filled uh, by the PPC are the best. But I just don't like their leadership uh, because I believe he's weak. I believe he'll never win a seat. He'll never be able to get them the kind of funding they need to ever be a real contender. And I think if he was actually serious about the party, he would step aside and let somebody else lead it that actually has more chance to uh, bring the party where he would want it to be and where all the people in the party want it to be. But I was never I had a falling out with Max or the PPC party. It was more of a fact that when I was invited to speak at the Supreme Court in July and it was supposed to be a freedom rally and I was invited by no more lockdowns and the PPC party. Once I drove the five hours. Oh, we froze up there. Uh, I'm still here. Back. He'll come back. There he, is. he must be going through a cell tower change or something. He said the name Rob. Rob Carbone. I'm trying to look it up now. Yep. Yeah. Hey, he, yeah, you kind of broke up there, Chris, so we lost you for a moment. We we lost what? your signal where, for about uh, 60 where seconds. Where did you lose? Where did you where did you lose me from? Where you were talking about uh, going to speak at the event. You were invited yes. and you said you were invited and then you broke up. Yeah, I was invited to speak just a couple days before the event. I had the emails to prove it. They made a flyer, put my name on it, and they used me to bring a lot of people there. And then when I got there, I was pulled aside by Mark Friesen, who's a member of the Freedom Movement, but also a member of the PPC and a good friend of mine. And he's like... Sorry, Chris, uh, we had an internal risk assessment and we decided it's not in our best interest to allow you to speak. So at that point, I realized they basically used me to bring people there to a so-called freedom event. And then they wanted to hide. So I wasn't having that and I didn't appreciate that. And I didn't like the way that they tried to do that. I thought it was underhanded, sneaky, but that's what politicians do. And with regards to not voting, I believe that federal elections are pretty much a mute point because we only have a selection of two people. We have Trudeau or we have the Conservative Party candidate. That's it. Nobody else has a mathematical possibility of winning. So it's very easy to rig an election. They don't even have to rig it. They just have to give you a choice of two people that they control and you lose. But at the municipal, val at the municipal thing, it's a different story. 
the municipal politics, especially mayor, is the highest ranking office in the country that has no political affiliation. There's no liberal or conservative or NDP as a mayor. You're just a person. And that allows you not only to bypass and overcome all those uh, points of division that they'll try to use to ostracize a candidate like me, but it allows me the unique opportunity to unite the city. Yeah. So do you have any affiliation with any political group? I mean, I, I still see this support from within the freedom movement or whatever people want to call it. Some people are now, you know, there's this unity movement. There's the freedom movement. There's this movement, that movement. Um, but you, you're not really affiliated with any p political party at this point. Absolutely not. Yeah. And I do that by choice. Fuck it. I'm moving to Toronto now just to vote for you. <laughs> So you you need to you need to initiate some fundraising. It's going to take a lot of money to. Uh, it's actually not going to take me a lot of money. I can tell. I, I I know the math. I've done the math. I had multiple political strategists, multiple analysts uh, look into this for me, and we all came up with the exact same number. And the fact of the matter is, we know our can the the, uh, the establishment candidates are going to be spending about one million dollars a month against us for a total of three million dollars plus over the next three months. And by our calculations, we're going to need a tiny fraction of the say, of the, the funding in order to have a campaign that outperforms them significantly. And not only does that show what it means for the election, it's just going to show what it's going to mean for our administration of how much more efficient and how much more effective we are. Laro asks, will the Canadian truckers receive a refund if you are elected? The if I had the power to do that, if there were companies based out of Toronto, and I had the ability to reverse their uh, business license cancellations, I would do that. But some companies were in other provinces, some companies were in other jurisdictions. So there's some things I would have an absolutely no power over. But for people that did have it, I would do, I would help. And if anybody in Toronto still had their bank accounts frozen, they'd be unfrozen, because I think that is absolutely ludicrous. And it's something out of Stalin's Russia or Nazi Germany, and that has no place in Canada for no reason whatsoever, especially for people standing up for freedom. And so I disagree. I, I disagree with you, Rick. My support's not just in the freedom movement. Yeah. My support is a lot faster than that. Sure. I got people all day long, people that wear masks, people that took the jab coming up to me everywhere I go. When I went to the gym yesterday, I had to take pictures with at least 50, five, zero different people, young women to old men and everything in between. Why? Because they believe in everything I stand for. So even the people that took the jabs, even the people that wear the masks appreciate me, even the people on the far left that hate me. You can talk to a lot of people that do not like me, but they will still agree that I would make a great mayor because they love the idea of having a strong warrior as their dog in the fight. And they know that I might tell them something they don't want to hear, but I would never lie to them and I'd never stab them in the back. So my support base is a lot further and a lot wider than people realize. And if I was wrong about that, the media would happily, happily put me in there. But they don't because they know the moment people recognize me, the moment people hear me speak, they're going to understand and resonate with what I say. I, I think your support base also comes from uh, people that have been fucked over by this government. And that's a lot of people. A exactly. Lot more people than you think. How many people lost their jobs for one reason or the other? How many people had their businesses closed down even though they took a vaccine and wore a mask? The government hey. disenfranchised millions and millions and millions of Canadians. And the biggest thing is they lost the trust. Canadians were the most trusting people on planet Earth. They trusted the government. They trusted the media. They trusted their doctors. Now hey, they don't before, trust before any the of them. Freedom, before the freedom movement, Chris, came along... Okay, I'm a, a, a owner of the marijuana business in 2018 that opened the day that they legalized. 21 days later, I was ejected from the property I was on. They put their locks on. Okay, kicked us out. I was stuck to pay five-year lease at $13,000 a year. Okay, uh, luckily I had it, paid it, whatever, right? Uh, and I'm still through the courts right now on something that was legal called cannabis, Okay. And we've been fighting for these rights just for the, the, the cannabis activism my whole life. I've got 33 now, I think, charges for cannabis. Okay, uh, I spent uh, 
multiple, uh, a couple of years in prison, 27 years of my life's been on probation, parole, or bail, some sort of condition. This is not free, okay? And I'm still on bail as we speak right now. That's why I know, where I know where you're headed. I'm not going to tell anybody where you're headed tomorrow, but I'm not allowed in that place, okay? Uh, I'm banned. It is what it is, right? I know if, if, I, if I say it on here, you'll have 10,000 people show up as usual, right? Uh, but I'm not going to. It's a secret. We know the same people that are involved. Okay, uh, and he just told me, I know it's, I know what you're down here for, and I, I love what you're down here for, but the word freedom to me, okay, yeah, they say it's it, it's legal, cannabis is legal, but why am I still before the courts? I gave away a million dollars worth of cannabis to feed the hungry, and it's all documented on uh, uh, legacy media. They've had their heyday with me, this and that, right? But I'm still before the courts, and now they're asking 18 months to 22 months, or yeah, just over two years in jail. Okay, for giving away marijuana for food to help the poor, right? And Doug Ford's partly to blame, okay, because he brought out the legislation. Me, I'm part to blame too. I get it. But if you're going to call it legal, it's not legal, right? So I've been yeah. fucked around, and everybody in the 420 movement, and there's a lot of people in the 420 movement, Chris, that are on your side in Toronto. Okay, right across the country. Right well, across North America. You, you answered your own question because legal and decriminalize are two totally different things. Legal just allows them to make a whole new list of rules for them to tax you and charge you and fine you and arrest you. Decriminalized would have made it completely okay for you to do whatever you want with the substance. So right. when they say they're going to legalize something, that just means they're going to take control of it in a way that allows them to profit off it and allows them to control you with it. Crazy crazy how, how you, you've done a lot of protesting weldon's talking about a big protest coming up this week how would you deal with protests and protesters as the mayor things like the tent city at nathan phillips well, square tent, things a, like a, that a tent city wasn't really a protest uh, the tent city was more of the people just trying to live there and i would be more compassionate i would try to create the conditions where there's no need for a tent city because those people would have government housing that they could go to and they would have job programs that would re-employ them and they would have mental health programs or drug uh, rehabilitation programs that would help them so they wouldn't have to live in tents they wouldn't be on the streets and if we did have people in that uh, in that scenario i would show them compassion and we would do what we can to help get them out of that situation we definitely wouldn't bulldoze it and drag them out of there and the same thing with protesters. When we have protesters like we had in Ottawa, that were I was there for multiple days. We literally had bouncy castles. We had people, children playing hockey. We had people giving away free food, and everyone was hugging and and shake and holding hands and singing and laughing. There was not one iota of violence. There was not one iota of people smashing windows or doing anything to vandalize. Right. But meanwhile, we had a, a militarized police response that cost how many millions? We don't even know. Maybe even more. And what did they do? They beat up citizens. They trampled old ladies. They absolutely destroyed the relationship between the police and the people. And that was a complete violation of the rights. And it was so heavy handed because the government knew they were wrong. First of all, when I'm mayor, there probably won't be protests like that because the people would actually be happy. And they wouldn't have a reason to protest. And if they did have a reason to protest, you know what? I'd want to go out there and I'd want to ask them why they're there and what they're protesting against. I wouldn't send 100 police officers in buses with riot gear that were paying triple overtime salary to go intimidate them, beat them, and arrest them. I would go there with my security team and I would address them and say, what's the problem here? And how can I help you so we don't have to have these protests? Imagine that. Imagine That's a mayor that actually for. cared. That's all we're looking for in politics. And I haven't seen that in 25 years. Where a politician came out to greet the protesters and get to the, the core of the situation. I've except, when, except of course, when Trudeau went for his photo op with BLM when he was kneeling. <laughs> truth. Very well, truth. You, you had a police chief in Toronto who also knelt with BLM. How do you feel about that? Well, considering that we all know that BLM and Antifa are intelligence operations and BLM is anything but a black, a black rights movement, we all know that BLM is not even uh, run really by black people. We all know that BLM raised hundreds of millions of dollars and gave it straight to Joe Biden and then used the rest of the money to buy up multi-million dollar houses for their higher up members. 
And we also know that Antifa is run by the same type of people and is listed as a terrorist organization in the U.S. And we also know that Trudeau himself was funding Antifa through the Anti-Hate Network and his good buddy Bernie Farber. So that's what I think about those plays. I would not, I, I wouldn't support those groups because we know that they're intelligence operations. We know they're terrorist organizations, and we know there are ways that the government uh, gives a uh, dirty money to them to do things that the government wants done that they want plausible deniability for. Oops, just, sorry, did I just expose more corruption? <laughs> so if you're on the police services board, you'll you'll be, I guess, addressing these progressive. Left well, they have a right to protest like everybody else. You know, um, they have a right to protest like everybody else, but I wouldn't give them preferential or special treatment like they've been getting through uh, uh, from Trudeau's government. A helicopter escort, police escort, all this positive media coverage. No, they would just get the protest like everybody else. I wouldn't make a spectacle of it because uh, they probably wouldn't be protesting because every time those people are protesting, it's for another agenda. Well, I'm kind of referring to what you're going to do in those meetings because I've listened to police services board meetings out of Toronto and they, you know, they're, they're, they're all in on systemic racism as a, a big issue that they're, they're dealing with through programs and so on. So what, are, what, are, what is your view on that? I believe that that's complete, just another method to create division and create more control. As we all know, Toronto is probably the most multicultural city in the world where every race and every type of people, including a vast LGBT community, are widely accepted and even embraced and encouraged in every aspect. So that whole idea of systemic racism and this whole idea of gender ideology and all that is just more points of division and more ways to divide society so government can create problems where they can create uh, where they can get more power and control. And I would do the exact opposite. I would I would increase race relations uh, between everybody, and I would downplay this ridiculous idea of so-called systemic racism. Wow. Hey, Chris. Yeah. The uh, back back to uh, what was his name, uh, Rob uh, Carbone. Carbone is that the same Rob Carbone that was in the Michael DeGroat uh, Casino? Uh, Nick Rizzuto, the mafia. No, it's not. Rob it's not. That's a different Rob Carbone. Okay, that's a different Rob Carbone. Okay, yeah, gotcha. it's a common name. Just like there's another guy named Chris Sacotra that has a big criminal record that they try to pretend is me, but it's not. Yeah, yeah do, you, do you want to address that? Because I had people big, sending me information record. about that, me. and um, and I know you're on another program where they were accusing you of things that you had not actually done. Can you? Yes, hundred percent. Light on that. Yes, I didn't there's light a, on that at all. Yes, there's another gentleman by the name of Chris Sacotra. And in fact, I believe he even went to the same high school as my sisters. And that's what makes it even more funny because I didn't go to the same high school as my two sisters. But this other guy with the same name did. And uh, he's actually four years older than me. He's not related to me in any way. He has a different birthday than me. But he also has a laundry list of charges, including heroin charges, gun charges, gang charges, snitching on people. He spent 33 months in jail. So obviously, if that was me... I would have never had a firearms license to have my firearms confiscated. I wouldn't have been traveling all over the world because I wouldn't be able to. And I wouldn't be eligible to run for mayor. So it's ridiculous that people would even try to proliferate that it was me, but they were. And the reality is that even though I've been arrested 26 times in the last 28 months and charged with over 60 offenses, both criminal and public health act, I have absolutely no criminal record whatsoever. I love it. Now, I, I have to say that I've had other, you know, I he keep hearing things like, Chris is just controlled opposition. He's a fed. That's why they arrest him and he still gets to travel to other countries. Do you want to do you want to address those kinds of allegations? Well, first of all, if I was a fed and they weren't worried about me, they wouldn't be banning me from airports trying to stop me from flying here. They wouldn't be arresting me in the airport. Uh, they wouldn't be trying to stop me from running in the in the election. They wouldn't have Pierre Polyevra's lawyer sending me lawyer's letters. And I wouldn't have been charged with over 60 offenses. They're doing that to try to dissuade me and try to test my resilience. But the thing is, I actually know about the law, so I don't break it. So every time they arrest me, 
they are the ones breaking the law, which is why I can continue to get bail and why I beat the charges. You think it's an accident that I just went to court for a five-day trial, a heated trial, and the judge just deliberated over a month and found me not guilty because I'm secretly working for the government, yet not being paid by anybody, yet exposing the government at every turn, and yet doing everything I can to actually help the people? It's absolutely ridiculous. And I want to, I want to, I want to say, what did all, any of these other mayoral candidates do the last three years to help anybody but themselves? What did they do? Absolutely nothing. What did I do? Well, I started two nonprofits, one called Back to Work in April 2020, because I foresaw the massive rush of business closures coming. And I personally saved dozens, if not hundreds of businesses from foreclosing. Then I started a nonprofit called Mothers Against Distancing to try to inform mothers how the psychological damage and social isolation and mask wearing on their children would be far worse for their health than the potential of catching COVID. We even tried to open up schools for the private school sector where I paid my own money and actually got it approved by the Ontario School Board only to have every one of my locations disqualified by the federal government under the auspice of not meeting zoning bylaws, which would easily be amended by minor variance applications if it was anybody else. But for me, they use it as ways to stop me from being able to get safe schools for children. So these are the kind of things I did. When Trudeau canceled the Santa Claus parade, the biggest, the most iconic event in Canadian history in Toronto every year, I did a press conference that said, I'm going to do it anyway. And I raised tens of thousands of dollars. I had seven professionally made floats from the same people that make them for the Santa Claus parade. We did a toy drive where we got 500 toys raised and we set up at Dundas Square in Toronto, the only place where you could take pictures with a professional Santa Claus and once you had the free picture, your child could go to the toy mountain and pick any of the 500 toys they wanted. And when I arrived on scene, the police ran over to me and they gave me a police escort and they blocked every street from Young and Dundas all the way to Young and St. Clair. And I marched with the police around me behind that parade. And when the parade was all said and done, you know what they did? They arrested me and charged me. They gated you. You know, you, you could be accused, okay, of a crime, but being convicted are two different things, right? Exactly. So. And if you don't have a criminal record, you're not going to be banned from any country, ladies and gentlemen. You could have killed somebody. You could have a murder charge, and I can still get you a Mexican residency right now if you want. And you can fly to Mexico, no problem. So you're trying to tell me that... If I got arrested for speaking out to more than 100 people, they're not going to let me fly to London or they're not going to let me fly to a different country? Are you guys out of your mind? I'm not allowed in the U.S. because of marijuana charges, period. Yeah. Well, listen, I, it's coming up on 8 o'clock, and I know you've got another appointment. Is there anything else you'd like to, to bring up or, or think that we might be missing? Honestly, I just want everybody to understand how important this election is. I believe that this is the biggest opportunity we had in the last three years to really make a difference and really help the people and really put a hold on this agenda 2030 that is going to be a huge effect on all of our lives, not just in the short term, but in the long term. That's what people need to realize. We're fighting now for the future generations. I'm going out and I'm talking to kids that are like 18 and 19 to make sure they understand what's going on. Because if we, our, our, our job as uh, older citizens, I'm 40 years old now, our job is to make sure that the children growing up now have equal or better opportunity than us. And that's going to require vigilance. That's going to require good people like us to get involved. And that's going to require people willing to do the right thing. And I am willing to do the right thing. And that's why I believe I'm the best candidate for mayor of toronto thank you well I'd, I'd love to have you back on again chris um uh, it's been a, a great conversation over the last hour and i really appreciate you you uh, you taking the time um i appreciate the questions you ask because it, it's it's very refreshing that i get to actually talk about what i would like to do because everybody else likes to ask superficial questions or ask questions about me but really this is about what i want to do for the people yeah, well, I'm, I asked very specific questions about specific issues in Toronto, and, and I was actually impressed with 
the answers that you gave. You, you're you're well versed in the issues. Thank so you. I, I, that's what I pride myself on. I pride myself on being on top of the issues. I pride myself on being a man who keeps my promises. I, pl I pride myself on being a man of integrity and a man who is willing to help people on an individual, personal basis. Thank you very much, Chris Guy. Um, we'll get you back on. Anything else, uh, Leo, before we sign off? Yeah, Chris, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Eh? Uh, Rick's got a lot of followers now. I think he's at uh, about 400 watching right now live. Okay, uh, and uh, it, it is what it is. Somebody said alternative news. Uh, I don't like to call it alternative news, but it is news. Just and call it real news. People, he's getting a lot of people with a lot of substance, okay, on this show. And uh, it's always great to see you. Enjoy my town tomorrow. If I don't see you, I will see you when you're down at the riverfront, brother. 100%. God bless Thanks, you guys. guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Oh, Thank you, Rick. Take care. Bye for now. Chris Guy, what do you think, Leo? You know what? He's, like I said, he's young, vibrant, a man of substance. He could go far in politics, right? Uh, that's what you need to shake it up, okay? Somebody that's real, somebody that's been screwed over, okay, that knows what time of day it is. And Chris Guy knows exactly what time of day it is. He's smart, okay? Uh, and he, 32 convicts or 32 charges and beat them, okay? No convictions. So the government was wrong. He's been talking about a lot of things. Uh, I've been watching him for the last couple of years. And everything that he said, he's been spot on, Rick. It's like a fortune teller. Okay, the 15-minute yeah. cities and everything else. And I wanted to ask him about uh, the Gardner Highway. If you go to uh, Lakeshore Boulevard in Toronto, uh, my brother has a condo down there where you take the uh, the uh, tugboat or the, uh, what are they, the, 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 uh, the boat buses over to the Toronto Island. Yep. As soon as you walk out of this condo, you get on the uh, on the uh, the boat and go over to the Toronto Island. Very nice neighborhood, okay. Uh, and all the way down that Lakeshore Boulevard down to the breweries, it's like a fifteen minute city now, okay. Crime stops on that side of the Gardner on Lakeshore Boulevard. There's no crime at all. It reminded me of uh, West Vancouver, okay. They keep all the shit out of that side of the town for some reason, and they. And the way that they do it is using the Gardner Highway, right? So it's like a 15-minute safe city for people. But you got to have this in order to live down around Lakeshore Boulevard. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, you're down on Jane and Finch. Well, I asked him, you know, some very specific issues about local, you know, Toronto-centric issues because he's going to be the mayor. And, you know, he uh, he's tuned in. He's he's aware of the issues. He's He's done his homework. Look at the Ford family, okay? They're a bunch of village idiots. Not very well educated, not very well spoken, not articulate at all. And look how far they've gone in politics, okay? Starting from the city era, okay? Not only uh, 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 Rob Ford be becoming the mayor, okay, of Toronto and, you know, getting caught in a scandal with uh, the, uh, the crack and the hookers and everything else that he was doing. And a lot of people respected him at the end of the day, even after all that, okay? Now, I don't trust crackheads, period, because, you know, when they'll go as far as to give oral sex for their, their next high, okay, and you're running the city of Toronto, you know, you're going to use, you're going to all allocate money from the taxpayers in order to get high, okay, plain and simple. I don't trust crack. Crackheads, crack dealers, meth heads, any of that, heroin heads, fentanyl heads, okay? I just don't because they will stab you in the back at the end of the day, right? But mm -hmm. that seat, that mayor seat, there's no scandal with Chris Guy. There's none. John Tory, I'd like to see at the end of the day really why he had to leave the office. Was it with uh, for sexual relationships with his uh, intern or was it with a little boy or, you know, there's always something at the at the end of the day. And I don't think it was over sexual interference going on with this intern. Okay. Because, you know, if I had a sexual relationship with somebody and I was sitting at the mayor's job, I'd tell my wife about it and, and ask for forgiveness. Either forgive me or divorce me. Simple. Okay. That's my job. That's my livelihood. Uh, it don't matter what you do. Right. So like I told him the last time, Get rid of that uh, uh, that couch that's in the mayor's seat because it stinks. Okay, there's a lot of sex and a lot of drugs that have been on that couch in the mayor's seat 
And that should be the first thing he dumps as soon as he gets in there. But he does have a following, like I said, a huge following. Anybody that's ever been uh, uh, struck by the government at all levels, from municipal, provincial, to federal, okay? Here's a guy here with some substance. He's been screwed over, and he beat the system. And I love it. I really so do. So they have, let me just see how many candidates. I'll bring it up on the screen here so people can see. It's They already have quite a few listed. Of course, they did not include him in this uh, Toronto Star listing. Anna Bio, Brad Bradford, Chloe Brown, Olivia Chow, or you know, NDP, MP, former. Yeah, Bob yes. Davis, Anthony that's Jack Fury. Layton's ex-wife, right? Olivia Chow. Yes, that's right. That's right. So they had Stephen the Holiday the NDP party. The only guy that I thought could have been a prime, a really good prime minister. That's his wife. Is she running in the uh, She was running in the Spadina area, wasn't she? In that uh, that ward. Yeah, she's a former Metro and Toronto City Councillor, former NDP Member of Parliament. She's currently Executive Director of the Institute for Change Leaders, which she founded in 2016, originally from Hong Kong. Chow was a councillor for 14 years, championing progressive causes, including subsidized childcare and co-op housing with her late husband and council colleague, Jack Layton. She ran in the 2014 Toronto mayoral race, finishing third behind John Tory and Doug Ford, and then Doug Ford went on to become premier. Well, you know what you're getting with Olivia Chow anyways, at the end of the day, you're getting NDP. Yes. Uh, once NDP and her husband was a leader, she you're not taking that out of her blood. So yep. you're getting NDP, which she is also, if you're NDP, you're also a liberal by the looks of it, right? Yeah, 100%. So that's, that's what you're getting with Chow. Stephen Holliday, a city councillor, Mitzi Hunter, a liberal Member of Provincial Parliament from Scarborough Guildwood, Giorgio Mamaliti, a former city councillor, Josh Matlow, a city councillor who, you know, you talk about um, John Tory and his affair with that staffer, actually, is what it is, not an intern, okay. but, um, you know, Josh Matlow uh, being held accountable for just tweeting out some criticism of municipal employees and then being uh, recommended for a 10 day pay doc by the integrity commissioner. So the code of conduct for the municipality in Toronto is quite high. I actually wanted to talk to Chris a little bit about that um, to see if he saw that as an issue that might be something, but um, you know, maybe for the next time. Uh, Gil Penalosa, an urbanist, former mayoral candidate, Mark Saunders, the former police chief. Um, you know, you talk about systemic racism, wokeism, uh, Mark Saunders, all in on that. I've, I've, I've listened to a number of police services board meetings where he has spoken. I've listened to interviews. Um, you know, Chris Sky, I, I see his position on, on systemic racism. I think he'll find himself at odds with just about everybody else on that board. And is Mel, is Mel Lashman's son on there? Remember Mel Lasson? Oh, I remember Mel, yeah. Nobody! <laughs> Who else do yeah, we there, have? There, Mike that Layton. That was the mayor I really liked, Rick. Yeah, Mike Layton, former city councillor, son of Jack Layton. Oh, really? So, Mom, that's not, uh, well, obviously he's not half Asian, so it can't be the uh, genetic mother, Olivia Chow, to yeah, Mike Yeah, he's the uh, stepson of okay. Olivia Chow. Yeah. So they're trying to double, double double down on it, right? Get the whole I, family running. I guess so. Cut your odds. Yeah, I would. I th I find that a little odd, actually, that they would run against each other. But politics makes not only strange bellowed bedfellows, but adversaries as well. I guess. Jennifer <laughs> Keys, <laughs> Matt, former chief city planner. Joe Cressy, former city councilor. Jennifer McElvey, deputy mayor right now. She's actually filling in the uh, the void left by John Tory's absence at the moment. And uh, Denzel Minnan Wong, former city councillor. So those are the other people listed, and they didn't put Chris Guy on the list. And you know why, right? Because well, you they tell were, me they what were, your view is. They were probably praying that he would have got a conviction. Okay, mm. Because once you would have been convicted, then you're a criminal. You're not running. You're out of the game, so why even try? 
but he just beat the 32 uh, 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 charges, right? So he's not convicted. He's uh, as law-abiding as Rick Walker. Okay, so they got to respect that. And Chris Guy, okay, I never heard of any of those those clowns on there, but Olivia Chow. Okay, the only one I've heard of before is Olivia Chow. Now was because of her who her husband was, her late husband. Okay, Chris Guy is much bigger than all those guys. Social media is going to do the trick for for Chris Guy. Social yeah. media is ten times bigger than mainstream media. People stop listening to mainstream media. You know, what do they call it? Uh, uh, the, a rag, the Toronto Sun, the Toronto Star. They're rags. Yeah, they're the rags. Who, yeah. Who reads the rags anymore? I don't. Even I got friends, good friends that are reporters. Okay. Uh, uh, my actually, this is funny. My ex girlfriend Rick, uh, I put her through journalism school, and she wound up uh, reporting in the Vancouver uh, Province paper. Right, that's her job. Yeah. Uh, in when we were 20, 23 years old, 24 years old, I sold a lot of weed in order to put her through school, right? And she went, took journalism school, and she's a journalist today, right? So she could thank me later if I ever talk to her again, right? But, <laughs> I see this as, with that number of candidates, I see that helping Chris Guy. They're going to split that vote up, and he's going to have a consolidated base of support and uh, and probably appeal, like he said, to people who otherwise might not vote. He's going to reach across the political spectrum, I think, more than people realize. And because he's colorful, charismatic, Young. and he has that social media power, I think he's a contender. They can't even hit him with the word racist, Rick, and I'll tell you why. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, uh, I've, I've seen his wife before, she's a beautiful woman, okay, uh, I've talked to her a couple of times. Uh, she's of Asi Asian descent. Okay. So they can't play the race card with him, and he's been with her for what twelve years? He said. Okay, so yeah, yeah, you know, I they, didn't. I didn't realize. I never paid much attention. Yeah, to, to her ethnicity, um, right. at all. I've seen seen her so, around. Never thought much about it. So they, they, that, that that just throws out the race card out of the whole race, because you know they'd go after that. In, in, well, they've in already a called him a racist. They they're they're they they played that card card multiple times go look at the interview he did on rebel news Are you familiar with that what rebel news never heard of him before i only, <laughs> I only listened to rick walker news yeah but you've seen what happened there we he uh he left the set right you saw yeah, that 100 yeah. yeah so you know, they've, the, they've tried to do that that's politics for you right they're gonna go down dirty and try and get all your little dirty little secrets you know, Olivia Chow have investigators all over yeah. Chris Guy, following him around. As soon as he makes a mistake, boom, boom, boom. They'll try and use adultery. They'll try and plant. Hey, they'll go as far as planting drugs. I've mm -hmm. seen it in politics. Planting drugs on uh, incumbents, okay, and then having the police raid them. You're out of the race. Adios, amigos, right? This has been going on a long time, okay? Uh, smear campaigns is what they call it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I asked some pretty tough questions, but I think I was fair. I tried to focus on the issues here tonight, and and he stepped up. I have to give him credit. He, I asked him some very specific questions. He came back with some very strong answers. I was impressed, to be quite honest with you. Imagine now, imagine you interviewing uh, Rob Ford. Okay. Ro Rob Ford? You mean the late Rob Ford? Yeah, the dead one, yeah. Yeah. The crackhead, right? Imagine you. <laughs> that would have been a little different. What a big difference between Rob Ford and and, and Chris Guy. What a big difference, mm -hmm. okay? I <laughs> I don't think you could hold a sentence, Rob Ford, okay? And Doug Ford also, right? Uh, either one of them. But look how far it's, it's taken them in, in politics, right? Uh, some said, you know, up until the last election that Doug Ford could have uh, actually – Ran for the uh, the the conservative uh, federal party. It probably would have won. Okay, by the way he talked, the way he looked, the way the things he was doing, things right. Now the best thing that I see from Doug Ford today is he's not on social media. I haven't seen any of Doug Ford's Facebook pages, this and that. So it was tearing him apart. You know, every time he'd post something, somebody mm -hmm. write something derogatory back to him, right? Uh, the things that he's doing, right? And Justin Trudeau, he's on there and. Uh, Every time I see him pop up on Facebook, I always have to comment. He's not doing a good job at all, right? And his support base, everybody that says, oh, you're the best prime minister in the world, 
they're all coming from India. You know, if you, uh, you, you look at their profiles, they're not even Canadian citizens, man, on his Facebook page. You know, and he's getting all this support that he thinks he's getting this support. Man, oh, so, man. So give, give me your opinion on the strong mayor's powers. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm referring to? He, he was talking about it. There's, and I'll explain it just to, to tee this up. And then I want your opinion. The provincial government has a new bill. Bill three gives the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa special powers. They can veto votes. They can veto uh, certain bylaws right. as they're voted on, right? Um, so it, and even with the budget, if the budget doesn't look like it's going to pass, he can basically issue an executive order to have it right. passed, right? Right. And, and the reason the government did that essentially was to expedite building permits and and funding for building projects, I think, because they want to build a lot of houses, like I think 150,000 new houses or something over the next 10 years or something. So a lot, a lot of homes anyway, and they want to expedite that process. But by giving the, that special power to someone like the mayor of Toronto, there are concerns that that, uh, that power might be abused. So there was a lot of uh, attention focused on John Tory. Would he use the strong mayor's powers to get his budget passed? And ultimately, he didn't need to do that as he passed this last budget just a month ago. But Chris well, Skye is sitting here saying that he's going to use that power extensively to jam through the things that he wants to get through. What are your views on that? Is that democracy or is that a dictatorial if, style of governance. If it's used properly, Rick, okay, now if it's used improperly, and I would be like, hey, uh, Ricky Walker coming to my uh, office and saying, hey, I want to build that condo place downtown, but I'm getting the shaft from everybody else. Here's uh, uh, an extra couple of million in your back pocket. Let it slide through. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's going to create corruption, okay? But if it's used in the right way, okay, and that the right way would be uh, transparent, nothing behind closed doors, you know, I, I, if I was the mayor of Windsor, it'll never happen, not in this lifetime, but if I was the mayor of Windsor, I'd be open to the public on every meeting. I'd be Facebook Live. And if you don't like it, get out of the stinking meeting, plain and simple. People need to hear what's going on in city council. They need to hear what's going on provincially. They need to hear what's going on federally. No redactions, nothing. What's said live is live, okay, period. Yeah. And that's what they need to start doing is live videos, Nothing behind closed doors because that's when all the corruption happens is behind closed doors, right? But now, could you imagine, that, like even the prime minister doesn't have that kind of power, right? The, 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 right. You get one vote. Like you're the mayor of Windsor. The mayor of Windsor gets a vote. But he doesn't have vote, veto right. powers. He doesn't have these powers that the mayor of Toronto has, that the mayor of Ottawa now has. And Chris Skye is saying that he's good. If he's elected, he will use it to promote... Right further his agenda which is no no 15 minute cities all of that stuff right but if, people if on the other it. side would say you know or whatever the issue might be um if, you know maybe they want to install these smart city or smart you know okay. street lights or whatever and he's going to say no and you've got other people other counselors saying yeah we want them in our neighborhood and then he's I, saying no i'm vetoing that is that democracy? It's not. I, that's not democracy in my eyes. Okay, I've sat on delegations uh, with my city council and mayor. Okay, uh, especially on the, uh, the legalization of marijuana before the stores even came. I yeah. sat on a delegation and I, I went up and I spoke in front of city hall, and then they voted on it. Okay, and uh, day yay at the end of the day, right? Uh, it did pass uh, for, uh, stores. That's what I was delegating for that time around, right? Uh, stores. And I was against the stores, the legal stores anyways, right? Because obviously I was trying to protect my own interests at that time. And everybody in the room knew the big elephant in that room knew exactly who I was and what I was about. Right. Uh, and me, I just wanted to free the weed. And if I could use it as a tool to wipe out hunger and homelessness, simple, right? But for them, do you have that executive order? That's too much power for a mayor. Okay. Yeah, well, he'll have it. And that's what he would use to prevent a lot of these 
globalist well, if you're ideas, have, you know. So I mean, only, I and I don't have an issue with him standing in the way of these, these no, programs, no, no. but it's a complicated we, issue, right? We have to trust in who we vote for, right? And that's the thing, right? We've seen so much corruption over the years. Like I said, if you're going to give me an extra couple of million dollars so you you and your family could build your condominium complex downtown Toronto, you know I'm passing that shit. I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Uh, I'm passing that, and I'm taking the two million cash and uh, putting it in my Swiss bank account because I'm a crook. Okay, you're never going to change that in me, right? <laughs> so that's the way it is. Like I said, if you're going to go Facebook Live or uh, YouTube Live every meeting, every second in city in City Hall, even when you're using these executive meetings, that's a different story, right? But where do they draw the line? You know, there's going to be a lot of backdoor deals going on, Rick, and uh, I'm not I'm not about that at all, right? Yeah, I'd like to be as transparent as the glass in my house. That's why I clean it uh, uh, every five or six years. Well, the strong mayors can't see act, through. you know, that's that's all new. So we'll have to see how these mayors in Ottawa and Toronto end up using that uh, additional power over time to see if it works or if it doesn't work. And uh, I guess if it's not working, the province can rescind that. But if it is working and it's resulting in positive things, that's a good thing, too. I don't know. It's something that they have used in U.S. some U.S. cities. I haven't looked at it that closely to see what the track record is like down there, but it's very interesting, you know, and interesting to see how he's looking at that as a solution to some of the really serious big issues facing uh, Canadian society right now, not just Toronto. And it's I've true. I've never heard of it till you just mentioned it today. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of a big deal. He's right too, you know, and I, this is, you know, it, in it's not his ways, fault, Rick. Hey, it's not his fault. Okay, he's running for mayor. Yeah, I mean, he's just, it's there. He's just, it's there. It's a power that's available to him uh, if he's elected. And he says he will use it in this way. And any mayor coming in can use it in whatever way they decide to use it. It's, it's not, see, it's very much like being a president of a city. Like the president of the United States can write an executive order. It's very much in the same vein as that. Yeah, but it's at the municipal level, and he's quite right when he looks at Toronto as being integral, uh, a trend-setting municipality. You affect change in Toronto, and you're setting off a domino effect that has impact across not just the country, but you know internationally as well. Because Toronto is an international city, and and. These kinds of globally focused policies do come down in Toronto, and Toronto is uh, an integral part of all of that. I've been Tor saying Toronto's for a long a time, if you want to make change, you get involved at the municipal level, your school board, your city council, run for mayor. You know, get involved at the local level because you can affect more change there than you realize. You don't need to be a member of parliament or a member of provincial parliament. All of those policies trickle down and the enforcement, the implementation of all of those programs comes down to the local level. And even enforcement comes down to your local police service, which if you're the mayor, you get to sit on the police services board if you choose to. Yeah, I, I should have told Chris Guy to watch where he gets his money for his campaigns from. You don't want any interference at this time. And it mm -hmm. don't have to be Chinese. It could be Russian, could be uh, American, whatever, right? Uh, uh, you don't want any inf interference in your election. Just keep it as, as clean as possible. That's what he has to do, right? But I've seen stranger things happen. So what do you think? Is it, what, what are his chances? How do you see it shaken down? Well, you know what? I'm, uh, I come from a betting town with Caesars Casino only being a mile from my house. And if I was to take a bet on it, he's probably got about a 70% chance, okay, of becoming the mayor. I've seen stranger things happen. He's smart. He's articulate. He's got to get out. He's got to run hard. He's got to knock on a lot of doors, okay, plain and simple. He's got to get to people. And, uh, the, the word social media is going to be his big thing because he's more social on social media than any of those clowns in the picture that you showed me of all the people that are running against him, right? Um, I think he's got about a 70% chance, Rick. 
And that's why this face ain't in that paper in the rank. Yeah, they're well, you know what? After speaking to him, I've gone from, I don't know, to, yeah, I think that he's he, he's probably going to win. Well, hey. With I've, gone, I've gone from, on, I don't know, to that. that with everything that's going on, if you look at the, this, the counterparts, provincially and federally, and you look what's going on, it's not, it don't take rocket science, okay, mm -hmm. for Chris Guy to win it. Okay, he's there for the people. That's the key thing. If you're not there for the people, you know, Chris Guy could say all that he wants, and he uh, he talks a great talk. I just hope that he walks a great walk at the end of the day, like his talk, because he's he's a smooth operator. Yeah. Okay, uh, he, he's 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 young, he's flamboyant. Okay. He's, he, he, he relates to all of it, to everybody, okay? And that's the key thing. You got to relate to everybody in order to win it. Like, I will say this. I don't think he will achieve all the things that he says that he will do because he's going to run up against more opposition than anybody can even imagine because he's going to run against the grain with the majority of the people on the police right. services board and on council. Both. Imagine how fast his executive order that he, you know, that uh, blue card he's going to have in his back pocket called the executive order, how fast they take that away from him. Mm. Okay. They're going to go, oh, we made a mistake, especially since no 15 minute cities. Guess what? Uh, the next, uh, we're going to call it scamdemic. Uh, we'll call it cars instead of uh, with the S. I don't want to get you banned. We'll call it cars. And uh, uh, guess what? Here's. Chris guy that's not going to listen to the uh, the the health minister because you know what why why should you look where we are today? I'm well, 50, I mean, just I'm tune three years old, Rick. Just tune in, years. tune into oh. any of those uh, any of those council meetings. You, you can also find you know the, uh, the 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 feeds for the the police services board meetings. I listen to them all. I've listened to them on the radio just driving back from Toronto. Sometimes they're broadcast. That's crazy, and and. Um, You'll 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 hear that they're it's diametrically opposed to his position ideologically. Systemic racism, oh yeah. I mean, you don't dare oppose that. You you have to acknowledge it as being a, a, a serious thing. And then all of the policies now revolve around that at the police in the in the Toronto Police Service. So right. for him to go in there as sort of the sole person who would be opposed to that. He's, he's going to have sharks around him trying to take a bite out of him constantly. So an uphill battle. But once you're there and you've got that mayor's position, you can you can push back pretty hard from that from that platform. Well, they'll take that veto card away from him so fast if he did a fraction of what he said he was going to do. And he used that veto card. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, it, if it, you have, as I understand the the, the law... If he if council comes back and votes two thirds against him, they can overturn his veto. So yeah. there is that check and balance in place. Uh, but again, it's all very new for Toronto and Ottawa only. I don't think any other municipalities in Canada have that, and certainly it's an Ontario thing anyway. So those are the two main municipalities that the two that have it right now, and it's a new deal. So. A lot of people were looking at John Tory, wondering how he was going to use it. They were worried that he was going to use it, you know, because it's it's an end run around democracy in the view of some, right? It is, but it isn't. So yeah. he's saying he's going to use it. Chris Guy says he'll use it extensively. It, it will become an issue. Donald like Trump used it extensively too, right? On all the presidents day. do. They all use it. On his first day, Obama, date, I think. <laughs> Biden, all of them do. Yeah. Well, that's the first thing Biden did, but he used his executive powers to overturn all of the executive powers that all the executive decisions that Trump made. Then you, you elect the next guy and he overturns everything and puts what he wants in there. Pierre Polyev. What's he say? The first move he wants to do is get rid of the carbon tax. Yeah. Right. But, you know, that's what I'm saying, though. Even the prime minister does not have that level of power. The prime minister only gets a vote. He can't just sign, right? All he what he does have is his party whip to get all of his members of parliament to vote according to what 
the party the, platform is or what he wants. The only way the prime minister has that power is when he's a majority holder. That's right? true too. Well, to right. a degree, yeah, that's true. Right. So he's got a coalition right now that's acting uh, a minority party acting as a majority. And that's a scary thing. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't get it at all. Uh, I look at Christine Freeland. I don't know who did her makeup. Like I said, man, Anderson's funeral home. <laughs> it's sickening. Right. It's sickening what I'm seeing in, in, in the world today, Rick. And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm blessed. I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm just blessed that I got my. Uh, my scruples together today because shit 20 years ago i wouldn't give a shit about any of these politicians okay at all man yeah. and uh, i feel really sad for the the next generation coming up and that's my kids uh your grandkids my grandkids man they're gonna have it tough bud really tough well you know? he's gonna have a tough job if he does get elected no matter what he is ambitious but it's not an easy gig and he's inheriting um a financial situation that is difficult. The, uh, you know, John Tory had to go cap in hand to Justin Trudeau to get a $2 billion bailout because they didn't have enough money to, to sustain the, uh, the, the police, uh, the, the programs that they have in place, right? They had a it's, shortfall. Now they've got a they say, What is it? What is it per year? Their budget? 16 billion point point one billion somewhere in that range. Yeah. Um, overall to run the city every year. And they are, they just in this last budget, uh, I believe it's a, a property tax hike for residential of about five and a half percent. The commercial is 2.75. And I believe industrial commercial, no, industrial is 5.4% tax increase. That being said, the mill rate in Toronto remains among the lowest in all of Canada, but that's because they have such high population density and high property values. So as a percentage of the value of the property, um, their, you know, their, their mill rate is actually quite, quite low. In fact, I think in Windsor, you've got a mill rate of about 1.8 and in Toronto, it's uh, 0.6. Wow, it's, it's that much of a difference percentage-wise on the mill rate. So well, in my Toronto, property if you have, taxes, if you have, so it's pretty good in Toronto actually for property taxes because if you own a house that's worth say a million dollars, you're paying just over seven thousand dollars in property tax per year. Not not even PDS, uh, Paul. We were talking about it last night on uh, Discord, and yeah. uh, uh, he's paying I think it was uh, forty two hundred dollars per year. Okay, and he's in Toronto, and you're not getting anything in Toronto for under a million dollars. And I'm paying in Windsor, I'm paying $2,200 a year. Yeah. It started out 20 years ago at 1800 So I've, I haven't gone up that much in 20 years, right? Uh, yeah. But, but Paul, it looks like you're going up another 5% by the sounds of it. Yeah. You got to pay for the uh, the services of Toronto, right? But Toronto's yeah. a monster. You got 4.5 million people in that town, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, I was seeing a thing on YouTube the other night that uh, the 49th parallel if you run straight from East Coast to West Coast, okay, is what, 5,000 kilometers, but it don't run that way, okay, uh, where we're at in southwestern Ontario, yeah. we're below the 49th parallel. 70% of the Canada's population lives below the 49th parallel, which yeah. is from Ottawa, Montreal, Windsor, London, Toronto, okay, 70% of our population. That's scary. Well, all these municipalities are going to have big challenges in the next few years because of inflation, because they have limited power to tax. It's basically all property taxes that they that they collect their money from, you know, some other fees and things like that, but primarily property taxes and transfer payments from higher levels of government. And they're not allowed to run operating deficits. They can run some capital deficits um, for long-term projects but overall, they're not allowed to run debts, right? deficits rather. So well, I, um, I'm going to let you know first, Rick, because I haven't done my taxes. I always get scared at this time of year to even walk in to do my taxes, right? But I made $106,000 last year. I got my son that's still dependent on me. My wife don't work. It's just the three of us at home. I'm going to let you know if I get money back or if I'm paying, right? So you'll be the first guy to know. And 
I'll be, sounds like great numbers. I'm not trying to brag or anything. Uh, you, I'm making 106 grand a year. Okay, big deal. At the end of the day, I have nothing, and I don't like it. Okay, I'm not taking no extravagant extravagant uh, vacations. I can't even afford to go to the fucking buck or two or to the corner store. I'm just like you at 50 grand a year or 60 grand a year. It, it's crazy. I can't save. I don't know how to save. I'm not putting in RSPs or TSFAs or any of that shit, right? Yeah. I'm just trying to live like everybody else, right? And uh, I'm going to I'm gonna find out what I get back if I get anything back. I highly doubt I'm going to get anything back. The government really needs that money, right? At the end of the day, it's all about dollars and cents. And we're just a number for the government. We're born with that thing called social insurance number and a birth date. And that's how they track you, and that's how they bill you at the end of the day, right? So, yeah. you know, I'd hate to have to see a nationwide strike, but it's going to come because I'm not alone. Anybody below me, man, we're, there is no more middle class, brother. Times, they've changed, and uh, the, the struggle continues. It does, Rick. If my struggle ends like this, uh, since I'm the boss, I still got to go back to work and check out everybody, right? So... It is what it is. Thanks. I want to thank everybody. Thank Thanks for having me on the show, Rick. It's funny how Chris Guy was surprised when I knew where he was going to. Viewers, <laughs> 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 but hey, I, he has nothing to worry about down south here because he's got the mouth of the south like you. You got some added insulation protection from all the the, the hoodlums, hooligans. Now, uh, <laughs> what else we right? Because all you got to yeah. do is all the mouth. And somebody said, "Yeah, the." I'm the Pablo Escobar of cannabis down in Windsor. Maybe so. Many people might think so. If you Google my name, you'll read all the articles. Uh, my eyes, Pablo, was uh, somebody like Robin Hood, right? Uh, I don't look mm -hmm. up to the guy who's murderous. I'm not. I'm all about peace, love, and happiness. And everybody in the group, okay, I'm going to say some shout-outs. We got Cindy. We got Torrid, Divine Intervention, Jordan, Matt. Okay, uh, Choosy, man, he's my favorite from Jersey. I just want to know, Choosy from Jersey, are you from 33rd Street in Jersey? Because I got some friends down there from the Louisi, very lazy crime family in Jersey. Uh, that's pretty funny. Chicken Lady, we got Eminem, we got them all out there. I want to thank everybody for donating to, uh, to Rick's show, by the way, too, right? He's got uh, the super chats and everything else that's going on. Keep it coming in because Rick's got a great show, and I don't miss a lick. I don't, Rick. You know, they, I got a job, look at, where I don't have to miss a lick. So once I'm done the Rick Walker show, I get really busy at work. I think I sent you a video of me flipping a 44 or 45. I saw that. Yeah. Walk at 3.30 in the morning, right? 180 degrees with two cranes. And I do it so gracefully that uh, uh, I don't trust anybody else to do it because it's expensive when you break a crane or drop one of those jobs on the floor somebody gets killed at the end of the day right so i'd rather be in, in control of it and do it a safe thing right but i want to thank everybody rick this is awesome you'll have me back don't worry thank you leo it's been great good thank show you. thank you there you have it